Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Alastair Pym. I'm the VP of Innovation and Partnerships at NECC, the Northeast Clean Energy Council. We're very happy to welcome you to this first of our uh, sort of fall webinar series on investor and corporate partner readiness. Um, we have a great case study today about the partnership that, between Schneider Electric and KGS Buildings, which in fact led to an investment as well. So we're going to cover both topics today. We have a great speaker lineup that I will introduce shortly. Um, but first, I just wanted to cover the agenda for the call and a couple of um, housekeeping uh, matters. So um, I hope you can all see the slides. Um, and going on to the second slide, what I would like to do is thank our sponsors, the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center and NYSERDA, the New York uh, State Energy and Research Development Authority for sponsoring this webinar series and supporting NECC in their, uh, their initiatives to encourage innovation in the clean tech sector in the Northeast. The Northeast for us includes uh, all of the states of New England and New York, and we have a great network of uh, partners, incubators, uh, entrepreneurs, strategic partners, investors, everything that we believe we need to help a clean tech startup uh, start their business and then grow and scale that business. So um, on today's call, what we're going to cover is brief introductions um, and then we'll go into the speaking program uh, where we'll have about 10 minutes from each of the three speakers uh, covering both some um, sort of best practices in open innovation and strategic partnerships and then this particular case study, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Um, we'll, we'll wrap up with a couple of uh, plugs for our following webinars, um, and we hope we have time for all of that. <clears throat> as far as housekeeping goes, we have muted everyone apart from the speakers, um, and we don't intend to unmute you at the end. We would like to give you the opportunity to ask questions using the Zoom chat, and I can see some questions coming in already. Please address those to Kate Johnson. And we will look through the questions and pick the best ones as we go through the Q&A. But um, please uh, do fire us your questions. So with that, um, I'd like to introduce our speakers. We have uh, Alexander Payne, who's a director at PwC Consulting, who specializes in uh, innovation in the clean energy industry. We have Barry Coffin, who is a senior vice president and uh, chief technology officer in the Eco Buildings Division of Schneider Electric who's also done his own startup. And we have Nick Gajewski, who is the founder and CEO of KGS Buildings, which uh, he will explain is a startup based in, uh, in the greater Boston area. So thank you to all of our speakers. We really appreciate, appreciate you sharing your experience with us and uh, some tips and tricks for startups and some of the, uh, the corporates are on the line as well. And uh, we got a, a about 50 or 60 people, I believe, uh, on the call today. So we really appreciate everyone taking the time to listen into this uh, great case study. So with that, I'd like to hand over to Alex Payne from PwC to talk about uh, innovation and strategic partnerships. Over to you, Alex. Great, thanks. Can you move to the next slide? Sure. So uh, again, my name is Alex Payne. I'm a director with PwC out of the Boston office. I work with companies uh, across the energy ecosystem from utilities to service providers to financiers. And within energy, I do help a lot of companies with their strategy, innovation, and corporate venturing initiatives. I wanted to, to kind of kick off the conversation today with two quotes, which I think kind of encapsulate the sentiment in the energy industry. I think with new energy and generation and storage technologies, uh, with flat demand growth, with regulatory changes at the state and federal level, demographic changes, uh, I think there's broad consensus that our industry is transforming. Uh, you know, I think it's also probably fair to argue about the velocity of those changes, but I, I certainly think that the, the vector at least uh, is, is, is clear. Next slide. But you know, transformational changes or industry transformations are not uh, limited just to energy. 
Uh, we do, uh, we run an innovation, uh, kind of a PIPA, an innovation benchmark where we interview uh, executives across a myriad of industries. And across the board, um, it's clear that innovation is kind of uh, front and foremost in many executives' mind. Um, some, some statistics from that survey, 96% uh, of executives believe that a strong innovation capability is a competitive necessity. A, a second uh, statistic that is kind of interesting is that 56% of the executives surveyed believe that, believe that disruption will come from a new market entrant rather than someone from in their industry. And yet the final statistic, 28%, uh, is 28% of executives believe that kind of they are where they need to be in terms of their innovation capabilities. So I, I think that's really the distinction that I want to draw here is kind of that 96, 98% that, uh, you know, that, I, that, that I've identified the need for a strong innovation capability, yet only about a quarter of the companies feel that they are where they need to be. Next slide. There is reason to look to, to innovation uh, and strategic partnerships, and we'll talk a little bit about strategic partnerships in a minute, but um, we also publish, uh, um, we've been doing it for maybe the last decade or so, kind of an Innovation 1000, where we take a look at the uh, thousand largest publicly traded companies that spend money on R&D. And what we found from that study is that the most, uh, that the, the companies that experience the most growth are not the ones that spend the most in R&D, uh, but rather the most innovative companies. And we have kind of a rubric for how we, you know, how we define what an innovation, an innovative company is. We, we don't have time to cover that now, but I think the key point is that, uh, that the, you know, it's, it's not about R&D spend. And, and furthermore, what we found is that there's really no statistical relationship between any of the key financial metrics and R&D spend. And we've run, we've put done this report again for over 10 years. So we have lots of data points. So uh, in, increasing R&D spend is, does not necessarily tie with sales growth, profit margins, or even market cap growth. Next slide. I, and, and just to finish the point on, on, on the previous slide, um, I, I think the key takeaway is that, you know, you can't spend your way. You can't just increase your R&D spend and expect it to achieve the same financial returns. So, so if executives believe that innovation capabilities are important and the data tells us that, uh, uh, that just increasing your R&D spend will not translate into financial returns, you know, wh why are companies not good at it? And I, I could probably spend a, a, at least an hour um, really kind of breaking this down into uh, a lot of different details. But, you know, at a high level, really, it's, you know, corporations are really good and they're really focused on and optimized for executing their current business model using their existing operating model. And we find that a lot of corporations have pretty strong, you know, we kind of call corporate antibodies in place. Uh, they're the people that want to resist change inside an organization. And there are a lot of reasons for that. And a lot of things we hear, um, you know, very often it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, we've done this before, you know, these are the rules. Um, and often with innovation initiatives, people are afraid to be associated with them because innovation involves risk and they de necessarily don't want to be associated with something uh, that, uh, that could potentially fail or that has a higher risk of failing. And, and more broadly, innovation initiatives fail for a few reasons. Um, many times they're not kind of clearly defined or articulated uh, what the benefits are. How does this innovation initiative tie to the overall strategy? What is the timeline to achieve those, uh, to, to kind of achieve the returns that we anticipate from using this innovation? And, and really the missing ingredient and what's increasingly important as companies begin to experiment with different innovation uh, operating models is really kind of defining an innovation strategy. Next slide. So to keep this, this point uh, very short, you know, fundamentally an innovation strategy is really uh, about filling that gap between kind of the incremental growth you expect from your business and, and then kind of broader growth goals. So, you know, in a typical annual planning, 
you'll set your, your you know you plan to achieve incremental revenue from executing your current pipeline uh, you may set stretch goals for your business units you may look at additional m a uh, to, to help achieve those goals and then there's really the innovation part that is is meant to, to kind of help you make that next step up to, to, to your broader growth goals next one As part of your innovation strategy, and this is where we're going to start pivoting to strategic partnerships, th there are lots of different, you know, what we call operating models, but, but simply you can think of them as, as kind of the, the operating models, the tools you use to help achieve your innovation strategy and your business objectives. And some of the more innovative operating models include things like corporate venture capital, incubators and accelerators, open innovation, licensing, joint ventures co-creation, design thinking, frugal, reverse innovation. This is not meant to be an, a, an exhaustive list, but kind of uh, uh, indicative of, of kind of the leading operating models that we see. And many of these kind of tie to, to, uh, to strategic partnerships. Next slide. So next I'm really gonna talk about how these innovation operating models uh, tie to strategic partnerships. And really what I'm going to talk about is, is, is how you can deliver value through strategic partnerships. Strategic partnerships can take lots of different forms and they can deliver value in different types of ways. Uh, and fundamentally, uh, you know, it's really about savings from, you know, you can use a strategic partnership to help defray R&D or development costs. You can do a co-development with a partner. Uh, you can also use strategic partnerships to, to provide new offerings in your existing market. It can help you access new market. And then for markets that you may not want to pursue, you can use something like licensing to, to monetize your intellectual assets in a market that you don't want to pursue. But these are broadly kind of the, the different ways you can think about how strategic partnerships can, can provide value. Next slide. I want to finish this conversation with really just, you know, covering at least at a high level some of these uh, some of these strategic partnership operating models. The first is corporate venture capital, and obviously corporate venture capital is is corporates investing equity uh, directly in in external startups. But there's a strategic partnership component to that. Uh, many corporate ventures kind of differentiate themselves from traditional VCs in that, uh, you know, they can provide access to the to the uh, entrepreneur or the, or the startup in the form of you know, access to sales channels, access to R&D expertise internally. Um, along those same lines, incubators and accelerators uh, can, can do the same, right? They, where they can provide access to, access to the, the intellectual assets and the other corporate assets that reside within a company. On open innovation, open innovation, uh, which includes, so open innovation was kind of originally defined as, uh, as partnerships with kind of universities and research, research centers. Uh, you know, today it's kind of more broadly defined as anything involving co-development and, and crowdsourcing. But, but really it's, it's about tapping the ideas uh, and the capabilities that are, are not inside your, your organization currently. And you know, all companies go through a, through a process of, of you know, do we build it, uh, do we buy it, or, you know, or, or do we partner for it? And, and open innovation and, and co-development is, is a tool you can use to kind of get the, kind of get the best of the best um, solutions for, 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 for your customers. Next slide. And then I'll, I'll finish up with, with licensing. And again, you know, licensing is really about taking your, your assets that may be stranded inside your company and licensing to, to, to maybe companies that are outside. So you can be an industrial products company and not have an aerospace and defense component and think that there's a great application for it, but not want to pursue it yourself. Uh, and that can be a strategic partnership as well, because in many of these licensing structures, you will, um, uh, you you will sometimes form a, a shared kind of go-to-market plan, or you may share some of the uh, IP that's generated, um, some of the developments on that kind of core IP that's developed uh, as as your product matures. So kind of that can maybe help defray some of your additional incremental development costs. 
So again, this is kind of a big uh, high level picture of the different types of operating models that we kind of consider in the, in the realm of, of, of strategic partnerships. Uh, next slide. So I, I really just want to finish off with, you know, you know, obviously innovation is is critical. It's important. Strategic partnerships are uh, a big component of that. As companies look, uh, as as their industries are transforming, they don't necessarily have the capabilities internally to to kind of rapidly pivot and meet the the the, the changing market demands. And strategic partnerships is is really. Is, is really a key element of people's uh, long-term innovation strategy. And you can think of your, you know, uh, a lot of times we've, we've been helping companies with kind of thinking through that build by partner, kind of that ecosystem of partner, partnership strategies, maybe sometimes it's licensing, um, maybe sometimes it's, it's a joint venture, uh, maybe it's a co-development with, with, a, a, with a company outside of your out of your market domain. So these are different tools you can use to achieve those kind of top level returns and reduce bottom level costs. And then finally, uh, next slide. So, you know, I, I think really now this is a really good time to be a startup looking to to partner with a with a corporate beyond just an investment. Uh, you can really look at corporate corporations are anxious and eager to kind of get entrepreneurial ideas, talent new ideas, new solutions incorporated into their, into their product portfolio. Um, and, and where do you start? I mean, obviously you're on this, listening to this webcast. Uh, so I think you know where to start. Um, but, you know, uh, I, you know, certainly the, the corporate uh, innovation groups or, or corporate venturing groups uh, are great resources. You know, again, beyond just the equity that they can provide, they can provide a, you know, access to certain internal assets. And they're also great conduits to the different business units, um, uh, you know, if there's some great opportunities down the road. And then, of course, uh, organizations like NECC, Cleantech, Open do a fantastic job of kind of connecting the large corporates with, with the entrepreneurial community. And then, of course, you have, uh, you know, Greentown Labs, Acre, which also do a great job of, of kind of connecting. And this is not meant to be an exhaustive list, but kind of a, a, a where to start. So with that, I will uh, thank you for your time and turn it over to Alistair. That was great, Alex. Really good framework to think about this challenge and some good tips for everyone on the call. So much appreciated. I hope you'll stay around for the Q&A at the end as well. Um, so next, I'd like to turn, I think, to Nick Gajewski, who's going to start from the KGS perspective, and then we're going to reach out to Barry. Is that right, Nick? That's right, Alistair. I'll take it away. Um, so thank you all for having us today. I'm uh, Nick Gajewski, co-founder and CEO at KGS Buildings. And what we're going to do now is sort of back up from the sort of strategic considerations Alex um, shared, which I think were great, and look at it through the lens of a case study, which is KGS, our, our company, and our relationship with Schneider Electric. And I think you'll see a lot of parallels with the topics that Alex talked about in sort of the evolution of our relationship. And maybe I can give some observations and tips on how uh, things have worked for us and, and what to expect um, in partnering with a strategic. The first thing I'll do is share a little bit about the company. Um, we've been around since 2010. Uh, I will give a timeline and a few slides and how it relates to Schneider. So I won't go into too much detail. Um, but I co-founded the company with two colleagues out of the MIT Building Technology Program. Um, we have been focused on solving challenges in the built environment um, through our PhDs and into doing business together and felt we wanted to have a, a broad and massive impact on the built environment to reduce energy consumption, to address climate issues, to improve the quality of the built environment for people, uh, to reduce operating costs make buildings more profitable and so on. Uh, and I think it's important to note there that we were motivated by a broad spectrum of, um, of drivers uh, and feel very passionate about it. And that has kept us going for a long time. And, and as all the entrepreneurs on the line know, that's, that's key to, uh, to succeeding and continuing. 
Um, what we do is we work with facilities teams uh, and empower them to manage better buildings using automated analytics. Uh, so I'll go into a little more detail about what that means. Uh, mostly we work with large buildings and large building owners and facilities teams and their service providers. So what I mean by that is usually buildings 25 to 50,000 square feet and above. Some of our largest buildings are over a million square feet. Um, we are connecting their data from systems and uh, helping them drive value from that data by creating new information, information that they never had before about how their buildings are performing, uh, where they're wasting energy, where they're spending too much money, um, and how they are prioritizing work uh, on their facility. Uh, next slide. If you're there. There we go. Give us a second, oh, yeah. everybody. All right, great. Um, so I, uh, one comment I wanted to uh, back one. Hold on, Nick. Sorry, uh, we've got a mind of its own here. Um, okay. Okay. There. <clears throat> Thanks. So before we go further, I, I thought it'd be good to speak through a transformation in facility management that's happening. Um, as IoT and connected buildings and cloud sort of disrupt industries all over, uh, facility management is one of them. Um, facility management has been faced with a number of challenges for years. One is it's a slow moving industry, slow to change and uh, the people who manage buildings lack often the resources or the technology to effectively manage, bottom line. Uh, they find themselves in a reactive mode where they're constantly fighting fires, they're reacting to complaints of occupants, they're reacting to um, owners who set energy and sustainability goals, but they don't always have the knowledge or the resources to help to achieve those goals. Oftentimes, they're spending money and consuming energy on unseen problems, uh, problems like simultaneous heating and cooling, um, problems like suboptimal controls, problems like broken valves and dampers that they, they just aren't aware of because they don't have the people and the technology to find those issues and to get them fixed or to prioritize which gets fixed to the last point. Um, what connecting building systems and buildings helps to do is to provide visibility both within a building and across the portfolio about the range of issues that uh, previously were under uh, prioritized or unknown uh, in order to proactively manage performance of the portfolio and of these buildings. Um, it gives them the ability to fix comfort problems before people complain about them. So if you have the zone equipment in a, in a building telling you that there's going to be a comfort problem or that a damper or a valve has an issue which will create hot or cold conditions before someone has to complain, you increase goodwill among the occupants and you fix problems before they become bigger problems. Um, so across the facility management industry, the shift into connected smart buildings and smart services is disrupting the way facility management companies provide services, energy services companies, mechanical services, control services. Uh, I remember a quote from a, a building owner in Australia who said, we want to take our operating expense budget for repair, maintenance, and utilities from 100% to 90% and spend 30% on our mechanical services, 30% on controls, and 30% on analytics that help us be smarter and run these buildings more effectively. So that's the sort of scale at which it's disrupting the way facility management is happening within the buildings industry. Uh, next slide. So quickly, how it works. Um, we are connecting to existing systems. Um, we are not offering hardware or installing sensors on site. 
we're connecting into building automation systems like like those of our our strong partner Schneider Electric. Um, we are consuming that data into a cloud analytics platform, and we have diagnostic libraries that we share across all customers through this cloud application that we can advance as one to create uh, priorities, avoidable cost, um, energy impact, comfort impact, maintenance impact, runtime hours, and other sort of more granular system level metrics. Um, that gives field level personnel, technicians, facility managers, facility engineers, information they need to do to get work done and to prioritize their work. It also gives executives and building managers or portfolio managers the information they need to validate that work is getting done and validate the impact of their operational spend. Uh, so it helps to drive operational efficiency on top of energy cost reduction. Next slide. Um, one important thing to note is that the type of analytics that we're offering has the degree of granularity needed to drill into the root cause of a problem. It's more than, hey, this building consumes more energy than other buildings like it. That's useful information and it helps put eyes on that building, but it doesn't always help, help you to get to the root of a problem. So if a particular building has the most avoidable cost, which is shown here on the left. Um, it may be because a particular system, air an air handler, has a problem like a leaking valve or a stuck valve that is costing a significant amount of money and excess steam and cooling consumption causing that problem. It's getting to that degree of granularity that allows a service provider to say, I know what the problem is and how to fix it and the customer is saying, this is an important problem, we need to spend the money to get it fixed quickly. Next slide. So to wrap up and to transition into Barry's uh, part of the conversation, I, I just want to give you a history of the relationship with KGS and Schneider and how we came to be working together and helping, helping each other. Um, in 2008, uh, we started the business, but it was in 2010 that we pivoted to a software as a service company. It's also when we finished our PhDs. Um, and we started small at our alma mater at MIT and grew by word of mouth and um, very limited sales and marketing um, to bootstrap the business. And over the course of 2011, Schneider was analyzing analytic solutions to build buyer partner with. Um, and we were fortunate enough to make it through that review, having uh, already known folks uh, at Schneider because they have a substantial amount of work at MIT and they were aware of what we were doing, uh, to make it through that review and develop an OEM agreement, so a reseller agreement in 2012. Um, working with Schneider from 2012 to 2015, we grew substantially working with uh, many parts of the organization, and I think that's something to be important. Something important to recognize that when you work with a large corporate entity, um, there are many stakeholders, and oftentimes you need to help meet the needs of all of those stakeholders, whether it's sales objections or understanding how it fits within the overall product strategy, uh, and so on, in order to be successful in working with a large organization like that. Uh, we worked 2012 to 2015 to begin offering the solution and then grow those offerings within the uh, sales channels. And in 2015, Schneider made a minority strategic investment in the business, and we've continued to grow uh, since then. Uh, we're now working closely with Schneider on a connected services strategy across the globe on how uh, control services to customers can be provided that are uh, leveraging technologies that connect equipment all over the world in order to deliver higher quality service to customers and better outcomes in terms of energy performance, comfort, uh, reliability of their systems. Uh, so in the grand scheme of things, uh, if you boil it down to some basic benefits, Schneider was looking to be faster market with lower risk and in, in investment. Uh, that was risk and investment shared by us and very lean on our side. Um, faster adaptation as well. Once we started working together, we could adapt to what's happening in the market uh, very quickly together. Uh, our benefits, of course, you know, for anyone who's, who's started a business, cash is king. 
Uh, stable and early revenue growth was really important. Uh, we had a, a very stable channel partner and working closely together to, to, to get there. Uh, overseas channels that we wouldn't have built otherwise. Um, also product validation. It gave us a very solid runway to iterate and refine the product and ensure that we had product market fit uh, over, a, over a gradual period of time. Um, so with that, uh, I will turn it over to Barry or to Alistair to introduce Barry uh, to talk more about where Schneider is today and, and how this feeds into that picture. That's great. Thank you very much, uh, Nick. They're really good. Um telling of the story and how it all, uh, you know, giving you some industry context as well, which I think is really important. Um, so Barry, uh, over to you. I think I've introduced you already, so I'm going to keep that short and hand it over to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Alistair, and, and thank you for uh, inviting Schneider to um, to present our story today. Um, and um, it's, a, it's a privilege to have all the attendees on the phone. We, we very much value this the type of work you all do in, in bringing innovation to the market is so important, especially to green tech. Uh, it's, a, it's a big challenge in the world today. And um, yeah, many, many great ideas um, coming from the startup community. So, um, so it, it's, it's, it's terrific to be here today. Um, so um, I, Alistair, I think we're, we may not have the exact right slide deck, um, but, um, so you want to go to the latest one that I sent? Yeah, I, hold on one second, Barry. I'm just, uh, I think I may have the wrong one in here. So apologies while I look. So uh, keep talking and I will find the right slide, okay? Yeah, <clears throat> so one, one thing, one thing as, Al, as Alistair um, tees up the, the slides, uh, uh, one thing I would, I would remark on that I, I, never, I, I never get tired of listening to uh, Nick tell the KGS story. Um, I, it was, and today was no exception. You know, the, it's funny the, the story has been certainly refined in the last few years, but but the fundamental um, focus on uh, and, and Nick used the word impactful, I believe, uh, a, a few times uh, during his presentation, and um, that that is certainly the case. So the, the, his company has delivered impact, uh, positive impact, um, to our customers and. We were discussing that back in 2010 when they were conceiving the idea for their for their company, and and that really got our attention. Um, that's a lot of what we're looking for uh, when we when we work with small companies and help them grow uh, is it is the impact, the practical impact, and and I'm sure all of you sort of um, got that sense of practicality from what what Nick presented uh, and, and, and they and they they've truly delivered on that vision um, so I, I do like hearing that and and, uh, and that's a I think a good a good thing for you all to focus on as you're conceiving uh, your your businesses um, so okay so I'm gonna present um, we got the slides up so I'm gonna present um, open innovation at Schneider Electric and Alex if you recall from Alex's presentation he had a section on open innovation as a way to spur innovation. And I think that's the most, we use a number of uh, innovation uh, tools within Schneider um, to, to foster innovation. We have an open innovation program. It's, I felt it was the most appropriate for this audience. So uh, it's, it's similar to what Alex presented, uh, but, and, and I think over time these programs tend to evolve and, and um, co-op some of the other models uh, like joint ventures and so forth sort of funnel in and through and, and you wind up with these hybrids but but at its core what I'll discuss today is open innovation uh, and indeed this is exactly how we engage with KGS uh, so so next slide please uh, so what is open innovation well first of all it's it really is an imperative at Schneider um, when when we take the example of, um, of building analytics which which Nick presented um, we we saw that this analytics uh, phase of the industry was coming our direction, um, and I think maybe today there's 40 companies. I, I think we probably had more like three or four we were vetting in in 2010 in, in earnest. Uh, Nick's company was probably the dark horse because you know they were really just coming out of their graduate program um, and didn't have a lot to show. Um, however, they were persistent engaging us. They they got their pilot running at MIT. We kind of had our eyes on that. Uh, we we do a lot of business with MIT ourselves, 
And um, so they eventually kind of came from dark horse to being interesting and then from interesting to being, um, you know, a contender and then from a contender to, well, you know, the story you heard today. Um, so open innovation was a funnel that kind of got us there. Um, so it's, it's really for us, it's about um, uh, combining um, internal and external ideas into architectures and systems. Uh, so it's very unusual that we would get some standalone idea uh, coming from the outside and just dropping in and creating a whole new, you know, say division of Schneider, uh, unless we made a major acquisition. So from the startup viewpoint, normally what's happening is large companies are looking at smaller startups um, as sources uh, for the deliverables you see below here. We're looking for ideas. We're looking for sort of new business models. Uh, we're certainly looking for talent. Um, and uh, we're looking for uh, te technology, of course, and products. And I, I kind of put the technology and products last. Um, really, the discussion with KGS started with ideas. Uh, what could they do for us? What could we do together? We met many, many times um, before they finally settled on, um, they had a coalesced idea, I would say. Um, we probably met, I don't know, five or six times, um, spent serious time together, sort of w brainstorming different things that they could do with us, for us, um, that, that would lead to uh, a breakthrough. Um, and what we're trying to do is, of course, lower our R&D costs. Um, we're, we're trying to lower barriers to entry. We're trying to accelerate time to market. And we're trying to introduce things which are new and novel to differentiate from our competition. So that, that's really how the open innovation process is supposed to work. Uh, and, um, you know, and not only do we work with startups, but we also work more with our vendor communities than we have in the past. We work with our customers and academia incubators and so forth as sources for these um, catalysts uh, to growth. Okay, next slide. Um, within Schneider, you know, we're, we're a large, uh, we're 26 billion uh, euro company uh, spread throughout the world. We have 140,000 employees. And uh, as was mentioned before, corporations are very focused on efficiency. Um, one of the ways we, we gain efficiency is we, we kind of try to make processes out of, out of everything um, that we do so that we get repeatability. Um, we can get a large number of employees on board quickly thinking in the same direction. Uh, it's, it's very difficult if you have a kind of far-flung um, empire, uh, empire you're running um, with multiple time zones, languages, sensibilities. It's really hard to get everybody aligned. So we spend a lot of time on developing consistent process. Um, and, and this is a, an actual slide of the kind of startup engagement process that we all use uh, to some use to some varying uh, degree uh, within the company. Uh, and and the, one, the green circles and red circle there, these are indicating uh, particularly important um, steps along them. Some of these are some of these, like an NDA and so forth, are bureaucratic necessities, legal le legal necessities. The ones that are circled, though, are really, um, you know, these are these are where the rubber is meeting the road. Uh, where where like if you look at the middle one, it says confirm strategic fit. Uh, when we looked at analytics, for example, we could see the market that the analytics was going to come our way. Um, we knew we needed it strategically. Uh, we had no choice. We, we had to get it one way or another. We were either going to build it ourselves or buy it or, or partner. And um, yeah, there weren't at that time as many options as there are today, but we definitely saw it coming. Uh, we needed to react, you know, and, and after looking at our own capabilities, we, we were pretty uh, already um, doing a lot of internal development. We didn't have the spare bandwidth to do it ourselves. Uh, and so it just it just made sense to find a partner to plug that hole. Uh, it just it just fit. And I would recommend to any of you that if you're pitching a corporate uh, as a partner or a um, you know as a possible funding source or, or go to market partner that you really hammer on this this confirming the strategic strategic fit. And try to make yourself invaluable there. Like you, you got to identify what's keeping up 
uh, keeping people up at night in these companies and solve their problem. Uh, if you can do that for them and do it in a way that's honest and, and delivers value, um, then then you know then they will they will really go uh, overboard to help you succeed. And and I and I think that's for many companies today are doing this, and not only Schneider. Uh, okay, uh, next slide, please. Um, so today, uh, when when I think about screening um, startups, and I screen a lot of startups today, um, we have sort of specific topics of interest in mind. Um, in my division of Schneider, uh, you know, it would be around building automation, like Nick said, large, really large commercial buildings, 100,000 square feet and above. Um, we're always interested in electric power, uh, and these days electric power is more smart, distributed, uh, digitized, uh, renewable kind of power, and it's being much more distributed like microgrids, solar, renewables. Um, you know, Schneider participates in all that. We see the growth. We're, we're doing a lot of innovation ourselves there, but there's more to be done, and so any new and interesting ideas there we want to know about. Um, we do a lot of work in data centers. We're the number one company supplying data center infrastructure, mainly electrical infrastructure, rack, racking systems for computers to rack them in data centers, environmental controls, HVAC controls, all of that for data centers. We do big business in data centers, um, many billions of dollars in data centers every year. And we're always looking for innovation there, and our customers are too. We, we work with a lot of the web giants. We work with all types of corporate banks and insurance companies and so forth as well, helping them build their data centers. And there's always more to do there. Um, we also do a fair amount of home automation, mostly in Europe and Asia on home automation. Um, not so much in the U.S. yet, but we're interested in making some forays into the U.S., uh, a home automation market, um, continue to attend a uh, consumer electronics show and have our eyes open for the right opportunity at the right time. Uh, haven't quite seen it yet, but we're still open. And in the home, we're also the number one maker of electrical power distribution, and um, you know, particularly with uh, breaker, circuit breaker panels and electrical distribution in the home. So we're always interested in innovation there. Uh, and then in sort of subcategories of technology, um, you know, just, just disruptions or breakthroughs in our core businesses, just anything that's going to upset the apple cart, we want to know about it, potentially invest in it, uh, potentially um, uh, even, you know, buy it out, et cetera. We'll, we, we're always interested in that. Um, and you can read on here some more of the details yourself. Um, I think some interesting areas that I see are, um, sort of the fusion of humans with systems is a is a growing area, uh, and what I mean is, uh, well, I'll give you an example. Um, how do people relate to the workplace? Uh, normally, within large buildings, it's been the building is there, it's running, it's at a certain certain temperature, the lights are on at a certain uh, level, and you step into the building, and the building doesn't even really know you're there. It's not it's not doing anything to adapt to you. And we, we see that beginning to turn around so that the buildings will become more uh, adaptable to the human as they step in. And it's not only buildings, it could also be the home and other types of industrial environments. So how do we more better uh, have machines, physical space, environments um, uh, kind of fuse with the needs of people in a, and be more symbiotic? And so we're, we're, we're interested in that. and, and Sometimes that's beginning to involve AI, which um, is important. Um, and regarding AI, uh, I would say um, we're, we're very interested in AI, but but as you heard from Nick um, from, from KGS, we're, we're interested in very practical things that we can kind of take to the bank quickly uh, that have impact right away. So we're, we're not, we're not so much into sort of very esoteric um, academic, um, like the next, uh, you know, uh, algorithm or something. We're more we're more interested in. I mean, we are interested in that, but in terms of investing in companies, we're going to be more interested that you have an idea pretty far along. It's delivering value. It can bolt into our business pretty quickly, and generate revenue and profit 
you, you know, pretty quickly um, with not a lot of friction in our operating models. It's your, your, the goal is to accentuate and bolster what we're already making money at and help us make more money, uh, probably more so than kind of thinking that you're going to be in a, in a position to um, totally come in and, and add on an entire new uh, novel thing that we're doing that we're, that it, that's, you know, from complete from scratch. Okay, so anyhow, these are all important areas, I think. There's, there's others as well, but these are the ones. If I was thinking of starting a startup today and aimed at our segment, this is where I would be aiming. Uh, and um, so I'll pass that on to you to, to think about. Uh, okay, next. Um, so what are the key challenges when, when we're looking at startups, when we're thinking about engaging, when we're thinking about investing, um, and as Nick said, we, we will do any, everything from um, coaching, um, partnering, uh, partnering uh, from a convenience standpoint. It could be one single customer that we have a relationship with a, a startup and we're just providing a driver or some connectivity to our system. And, or we could have an OEM relationship uh, where we're reselling or we could um, actually make a formal uh, venture capital style investment. Uh, into a, a startup. So, excuse me, we'll do a number of those, um, anything along that spectrum uh, we're, we're open to, depending on the situation. But the ca challenge is that our business is uh, very, what we call very long tailed, um, in that we oftentimes the relationships we have with customers are 30 year or longer. Um, that That's very typical for us. And um, we also deal with a lot of safety and environmental and regulatory um, challenges. Uh, and it's important that any startup that we work with sort of has a, uh, a seriousness and a sensibility about them. We're not, we're not like Snapchat, you know, um, we're, we're not, we're not, you know, I mean, that stuff's cool, but that, we're not fleeting. Um, we tend to be foundational uh, to the way the world works, and there, there comes with that a sort of responsibility to be stable, to be always available, to be reliable, to be, um, yeah, to, to just be safe and, and to be there. And, and so um, because of that, we, we need to make healthy margins um, with the products when we install them or during their service period, which could be yeah you know, 30 years or more. And um, so we need to make sure that, that the profitability is there from the beginning and that it can live and, and be profitable for a long, long period of time. And a lot of startups find that hard to kind of get their, arm, their arms around. Uh, it's not an easy, uh, it takes investment and a way of thinking um, to build long tail businesses, um, but to be to be most effective with us, that's what you kind of need to do. Um, so you, you need to kind of ask yourself, can you achieve global scale and quality? As as um, you heard from the previous presenter, you know they did that. Um, we weren't sure if they could do that, but um, they did, and and they're doing quite well at that. In fact, I think a, a good deal of their growth comes from our global business. Uh, they they had to get passports and figure out how to go navigate the world, uh, and uh, yeah, and close deals. So and help us close deals. So um, yeah, that's that's big work for a small company. Um, so we're we're very concerned also when we go into these things, and this is this is a big big thing that we get nervous about is we go to all this work to help a small company become global. Uh, we help them get their quality up to um, world class and, and achieve all the safety and robustness you need to be successful uh, at that scale. And then you get acquired by a competitor. Um, so um, this is the thing we really fear most. More, We fear this more than um, companies going out of business. Um, if a lot of startups, you know, don't make it uh, for a variety of reasons, um, financial, managerial, et cetera. Uh, we, we understand that uh, we, we can deal with that, but what, what we can't really deal with well is if our largest competitor after we spend, after we spend some years um, grooming and growing and investing that the competitors come in and reap the reward that just drives us crazy. So 
we're we're constantly on the lookout for that, and um, we we need to be able to work with you um, to help you achieve growth and sovereignty. Um, it's a very fine line you walk here. You you don't want to upset the startups' innovation and by being too heavy, but at the same time we need some protection. So that needs to be negotiated. Um, and we can give you some sense of how that may be palatable to you and to us. We'll, we'll give you some ideas if we engage on how that's done. And uh, yeah, we need to make sure we can each build trust in one another to be able to perform uh, commercially, globally at a, at a rapid pace when things get when things start ramping up. Okay. Um, so next slide, please. So Barry, um, uh, we've yep. got. Um, Yes, I do want to leave a little time for questions. Okay. <clears throat> yes. Yes. So, okay. So we'll wrap it up uh, quickly. So uh, this is just a, a view of how uh, these little stars represent companies here. I had to take the names out because they're proprietary. Uh, but but we have a big funnel of thousands of companies. We screen. Uh, we take presentations from hundreds. We we evaluate. You know, say 50 to 60 a year. Uh, we probably test another 10 to 15 in our labs, do hardcore testing with the idea that we're going to go to market. Uh, and you see there a mixture of big companies and small companies. Um, I can't name them all because of contractual reasons, but but we have a big pipeline. And certainly some of you on the call may be interested in, in, in getting a hold of us uh, uh, to enter the pipeline and start the journey. Um, we'd, we'd be welcome to, to hear your story. Uh, so next, please. Um, th this is how to move forward. Uh, we'll, we'll send out, we'll email out this slide to you so you can get a hold of me uh, and, and or my assistant, Wendy. Uh, she can help coordinate. I kind of gave you some suggestions of how you should approach us. Uh, we want to hear about practical stuff, how to make, how we can both make money together is what we're interested in, how you can solve problems for us. Um, okay, next. And that's it, so thank you. Barry, that was wonderful. Thank you very much, and really good tips for startups. And uh, appreciate the uh, how to get in contact with you as a follow-up. Um, well, we have some great questions here, um, so I'm going to go through them, and we'll maybe suggest someone to start answering. But we can certainly go around the, the three speakers. Um, I mean, you, Barry, you talked a lot about you know the need to make sure there's trust and and um, you know that everything's going to work together, etc. But one of the questions is, how can we decrease the time to create a strategic partnership? So, is that realistic? Is there any way to shorten this process? Um, it, it depends a lot on the readiness and robustness. Um, it can go. I mean, I've seen it go as quickly as, as getting to a single deal with a customer in, say, three months, uh, two months even probably more like three, um, and to have something long-term meaningful, like you saw with Nick, it, it could take multiple years before we're making a strategic investment. Okay. Any, Alex, do you have any other comments on that one? Or Nick? No. Maybe a mildly yeah. comment. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah. No, I, I was going to say no. I was going to say no, no comments. <laughs> I, I think the big thing, the big thing with the industrials is is making that making yourself positioned to to meet that thirty year tail I mentioned. That, that's what that's what drives our, our thinking on a lot of these with the industrials. Yeah. And I would I would just say the closer you already are to having shown that you have a product that meets a need that people will pay for, that aligns very well with the need of the strategic in, in the way that their industry is likely to be changing, that will compress the timeline. Uh, everything else is sort of people working effectively together. That's great. Thanks, Nick and Barry. Um, next question is, uh, is there a best timing in the kind of stage of maturity of the startup. So as a startup asking the question here, we're on a seed round now. Should we involve a strategic partner within this round or wait until a later round, like a series A or B, et cetera? Yeah, this is Alex. 
Go maybe ahead. I'll go first and I can, I can, I can, I can pass it off. So what we see uh, companies doing with their innovation strategies is kind of aligning different operating models to capture, uh, to kind of capture, um, you know, these strategic partnerships at different stages. So for example, you may use corporate venture capital and use that to identify companies that are maybe at the BC uh, round and use that and, and partner with them through through corporate venture capital. Um, and then you may use an incubator or accelerator for companies that are, you know, maybe five to seven years out, that would be kind of angel seed stage. So, uh, you know, you know, kind of a, a best practice for your innovation strategy is to make sure you, you can kind of capture, uh, you, you can kind of capture that entrepreneurial innovation, you know, at kind of seed a, you know, B, C, and then, you know, kind of more mature rounds. So that, that's the long way to, to say, I, I don't think there's a, there's a stage that's, that's optimal for, for many companies. I think a lot of it is just finding the right entry point. Is it through an incubator, an accelerator? Is it through a CDC? Is it through a, a, a joint venture? Okay. Thanks, Alex. Um, there's, there's uh, another question here is like, um, is a half equity investment, half technology licensing fee a common strategic partnership? You kind of touched a little bit on that, uh, both Nick, I'm sorry, both Alex and, and Barry. So any response to that question? Um, yeah, I, I like that model. Um, I, again, it, to us, it gets into at least having an eye on on uh, some exclusivity or at least option for exclusivity um, and that that gives me some comfort that if I invest uh, I'm not going to be usurped by competi competitors without knowing it. Um, okay um, and then I'm not I know this strategic partnership evolved into an investment um, but is there a typical range of investment from a strategic? Uh, the question here says, you know, is 200,000 or is it 5 million? So is, is there a, any patterns there? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I think most strategics, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll go, they'll do the 2 million, you know, they, they, they will, but they're not, but typically, uh, typically they're, they're going to be, uh, following investment uh most strategic and alex can confirm this but i know in schneider's case when we're making formal investments uh we, yeah we're normally following either other venture companies friendly venture companies that we trust or other strategics could even be a competitor sometimes we co-invest with our competition uh which is fine um so so I, i'm not sure if that fully answers your question but, but that's that's my view Last comment from uh, Alex. I can, can you repeat the question? I, I want to make sure I understand. I thought Barry answered it. If I just, yeah. What, the what, what's the typical there? What's the typical financial range of a common strategic partnership? But I think the question I mean oh, the investment. Yeah, side. that's a tough one. Yeah, yeah. It, it all depends on the stage. Yeah, I mean if it's if it's corporate venture capital and it's you know BC, what an average round maybe twenty to thirty million uh, in terms of a capital raise, and so then. A corporate's percentage of that could, you know, depending. I, it, it's tough to answer in a short in a short range. I, I think that the short answer is, it's it, it could be all over. It could be all over the map. If you think about like an accelerator model, right, where where you know maybe you sit at at, at Schneider's facility, they take a, a you know a five percent equity stake uh, at at a hundred k investment or something along those lines, and and let you use the space and the facilities and the access to the R and D, then then that can be pretty small, and and maybe again the CVC is targeted at later later innovation. So it, it, I I don't I I don't see a common trend or thread in terms of the size of the investment. It's just what 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 operating model you use to. To, to yeah, that, I think that's right. And and I, within Schneider, we have three or four uh, operating vehicles to, to to make investments. So uh, we would we would tend to try to tailor whatever investment model to what our interests were and what your needs were. It could be anything from a few hundred thousand to you know several million. Um, I I think that most 
you, you know, it's hard. It's hard. The more formal you get, you you have to raise. You have to be going after enough millions to cover your legal costs. So once we get our formal, um, if we're co if we're co if we're co investing with a venture capital company, they're going to want us to come in with at least five million, and and we can't. We can't we can't really place less than five million of those situations because we get so watered down with legal contractual stuff and procedural board meetings et cetera. So so you, you kind of once you get into your B round, let's say, then you're you're kind of in that range. Um, and then we that's, would that's great, Barry. I, we, we've got a wrap. So um, I want to thank our presenters today, our speakers. Many thanks, Barry, Alex, and Nick. Um, some person asked if we were going to share the slides. We're actually going to share the slide deck, but the webinar is being recorded, and this will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. So we'll send a link out to everyone who's uh, registered and attended. There are some other questions. I'd encourage you to address those to the presenters. Um, Barry and Alex were kind enough to give you their details, so I would encourage you to follow up with them as well. And then finally, we have got. Uh, four more webinars, as you'll see on the slide now, and we'll be um, marketing those with emails and tweets, etc. So, would welcome you back for those webinars and encourage you to keep asking questions. So, thanks again to the, everyone for attending. Thanks to our speakers, and thanks again to our sponsors, the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center and NYSERDA. Have a great day. <laughs>